Today is April 26, 2016, and we're in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let us thank our Heavenly Family and ask them for guidance. Heavenly Family, Toda, thank you. Thank you so much for all the blessings that you've given to us. Thank you for the revelation of truth and for the principles to investigate, really investigate anything. So thank you so much for uh, sharing these principles with us. Please share more with us, improve our understanding, correct our misconceptions, help us to have your character. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Please guide us as we continue to investigate the community rule. Help us to see it for what it really is and to be able to judge it according to righteousness. Thank you, Heavenly Family. Guide us into all truth. We claim that promise and we are confident that you are fulfilling it. Toda, bless us now and uh, guide us all into your love. Thank you, Heavenly Family. We ask these things, Hashem Tzimach, in the name of Branch. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, um, were there any more comments on the last paragraph that we went through before we go on to the next one? I'm thinking perhaps not, but perhaps uh, there's a need to recap things. Uh, I'll briefly just recap. So, of course, the first section was just outlining the introduction to the community rule and the purpose of it and the basic principles for the community. And then there was the covenant ceremony, entering into the covenant with the blessings and curses and so on. And then, following that, there was the paragraph that we just went through, which describes how the covenant ceremony is to be done year by year, and as we found elsewhere, it was most likely done at the Feast of Pentecost. And then it describes how people are to enter, and it describes the, the order, and so on and so forth. And then when it describes that order, it lays out how the community is set up in ranks. And there's different groupings of people. And the last section was describing how no one is to seek to move up or down and all of that uh, from his allotted position. And it gives the reason for that. And the reason that it gives is that it is to be according to the holy design and they shall all live in a community of truth and virtuous humility, of loving kindness and good intent one towards the other. And they shall all of them be children of the everlasting company. That's the last part of the paragraph that we just read. And of course we discussed it in connection with other passages um, from some of the ancient writings of Israel, including Exodus and... First Enoch, some other passages that uh, describe this basic uh, order, and also we looked at some things from the Thanksgiving hymns, which have a similar type of idea, and then we looked at quite a number of statements from Ellen White, which describe how heaven has order, and how God's people uh, in the Exodus movement were given such an order and that the apostolic movement was also given such an order, and that we today are to be no less organized, no less ordered, but are to work in harmony with heaven, reproducing the order of heaven in the church on earth, and that thus the work can be successful, and it will be blessed. Uh, also in the statements from Ellen White, we looked at a number of them which relate to the idea of each person having an allotted place or an allotted position and task and so on, and the idea of dissatisfaction 
within one's allotted position, and we saw that that was the case with Lucifer. He was dissatisfied, and of course it was without cause, and that's what started this whole rebellion. Eve also uh, sought to change her allotted position. Adam also sought to change his allotted position. And so she talked about this, and she talked about the um, importance of of basically recognizing the wisdom in the plan of our heavenly family in giving us the various positions that they have. Um, so that was, you know, that's a brief summary of what we have gone through. Um, if anyone does still have a comment, feel free to say so. If not, if you don't have a comment, just say, ready to go on. Ready to go on. Okay. Ready to go on. <laughs> what <Wonderful. Go> ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Um, so, the next paragraph, it is uh, 1QS, column 2, line... 26 or so is where we're at. And this is just the very end of column two uh, before getting into column three. So I'm going to read this whole paragraph first. And the way that I'm going to read it has some changes from the translation by Giza Vermez. Um, in looking into this, comparing other translations and comparing the Hebrew, this seemed to be a more literal translation, the way I'm going to read it. It's just for a couple sentences that it's like that, though. For the most part, um, I didn't see anything important or anything really significant that Giza Vermez translation either got wrong or just could have been stated better. Um, so this is how it's going to be, I guess. <laughs> so I'll read it and we'll, we'll see the content of this paragraph. Bless us, Heavenly Family. No man shall be in the community of his truth who refuses to enter the covenant of God so that he may walk in the stubbornness of his heart. For his soul detests the wise teaching of just laws. He shall not be counted among the upright, for he has not persisted in the conversion of his life. His knowledge, powers, and possessions shall not enter the council of the community. For whoever plows the mud of wickedness returns defiled. He shall not be justified while he maintains the stubbornness of his heart, since he prefers to gaze on darkness rather than the ways of light. He shall not be reckoned among the perfect. He shall neither be purified by atonement, nor cleansed by purifying waters, nor sanctified by seas and rivers, nor washed clean by any ablution. Unclean, unclean shall he be, for all the days he despises the laws of God, refusing to be instructed in the community of his counsel. So that's the paragraph that we have before us now. Does anyone have any comments or questions on the paragraph as a whole before we get into uh, going back through it from the beginning? The overall point that I'm seeing here is just basically saying that uh, well, it, re it reminds me of something, uh, and I don't remember where, where it is in the Old Testament, but everyone did that which was right in their own eyes or something like that. So, and if I'm remembering it correctly, it was a negative um, statement. Like, it wasn't a good thing. Like, 
everyone doing right in their own eyes wasn't a righteous thing. They weren't actually doing righteousness. Everyone was just doing what they wanted to do, what they thought was acceptable or quote-unquote right. That's and, uh, in Judges. Judges. I just wanted to mention for everyone, that's Judges, and it's definitely a negative thing. Yeah. And so basically... Um, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting to me, this particular paragraph. I remember the first time we read it, or first or so time we read it, what stood out to me about it was the fact that anyone who didn't honestly join in the community and want to follow God's laws, they weren't even allowed to bring their possessions, their powers, or knowledge into the community. Mm -hmm. So in other words, their services, their finances, none of that was accepted. It wasn't like they were saying, yeah, we'll benefit from you, but you just can't benefit from us. They were like, no, you're not a part of the community. You've chosen to not be, and you have to be separate and in all ways. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. One thing I noticed is um, the repetition of the word unclean, and I'm remembering that someone who is ceremonially unclean by virtue of an infection, I believe it was, had to say unclean, unclean, whenever they were in the presence of others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very interesting parallel because that was a situation in which they had to be outside of the camp and here they have to be outside of the community. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Uh, the other aspect that I wanted to mention is I was just looking at this and looking to the next paragraph and saw that the next paragraph actually kind of continues on this paragraph and offers some explanation. So I thought maybe I would just read the next paragraph as well just for the sake of getting uh, a fuller view of the basic idea, not to go into the details of this paragraph yet. But, um, you know, the last part of the paragraph that we just read, I'll just read it again and then go right into the next one just to see how it illuminates this paragraph. Unclean, unclean shall he be for all the days he despises the laws of God refusing to be instructed in the community of his counsel. For, or because, it is through the spirit of true counsel concerning the ways of man that all his sins shall be wiped away, that he may contemplate the light of life. He shall be cleansed from all his sins by the Holy Spirit, uniting him to his truth, and his iniquity shall be wiped away by the spirit of uprightness and humility, by the humble submission of his soul to all the laws of God, his flesh is cleansed by being sprinkled with purifying water and made holy with the waters of repentance. Let him, then, order his steps to walk perfectly in all the ways commanded by God concerning the times appointed for him, straying neither to the right nor to the left, and transgressing none of his words, and he shall be accepted by virtue of a sweet-smelling atonement before God, and it shall be to him a covenant of the everlasting community. Very interesting. Yeah, a number of very interesting aspects. Um, but the main reason why I was reading it for the sake of this paragraph, the first one that we just read here, is because it explains the last section um, by saying that it is through the spirit of true counsel concerning the ways of man that all his sins shall be wiped away. So it's, it kind of shows you that it's a given that if someone refuses to enter the community of his counsel, the community of God's counsel, then they're refusing his counsel. So when it says they cannot be justified all the days that they remain in the stubbornness of their heart, and refuse to enter the covenant and enter the community. And it says, you know, it says they can't um, have their sins wiped away. 
during that time while they maintain that position. And here it's saying, well, that's because it's by the spirit of true counsel that sins are wiped away. And so it just makes sense that if someone refuses to enter the community of his council, that they'll be left without cleansing. Wow. Yeah. So any other uh, comments or questions on the overall paragraph, or are you guys ready for us to go back to the beginning of it? Okay. I'm ready to begin at the beginning. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Okay, so I'll read the first part again. No man shall be in the community of his truth who refuses to enter the covenant of God so that he may walk in the stubbornness of his heart. For his soul detests the wise teaching of just laws. Any comments or questions? You can't even begin to start on this path until you're ready to listen to wisdom's teachings. I mean, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and yeah. that's—I mean—that's just the whole thing. And she's she is the life giver. She's the one who resides um, on resides on the atonement lid and she's the the one who's the source of atonement. Amen. Why is it so hard to select, to choose, to choose to choose constantly the wisdom versus the lie that, or the lies, the myriad of lies that we all live every single day? Why is it so difficult? That's the mystery of iniquity. We're going to need that unraveled pretty rapidly. (laughs) Any other comments on that? Yeah, the stubbornness stood out to me, how that's a characteristic of our adversary, something to keep in mind. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, I did want to comment a little bit uh, on your comment, John. The best way that I can put it is that it's actually not hard. The thought of it being hard is actually simply a deception. That is one of the very well, important in one sense, lies in, ter- in terms of the devil's uh, plan and scheme of things. That's an important aspect of the lie to keep people from actually choosing the good all the time. So here's the thing. It says in Isaiah chapter 7, referring to Emmanuel, that he shall eat the butter and the honey that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. So the butter and honey, okay, well, what's that represent? And scripture elsewhere and even just the example of Christ, how, you know, Christ came as Emmanuel, and how did he refuse the evil and choose the good? Well, he answered with an it is written, right? So it was actually the truth that he was digesting that enabled him to refuse the evil and choose the good. So that's what the butter and honey symbolizes. It represents the truth. And what does truth do? Well, it wipes away lies. So if truth is what enables us to choose the good and refuse the evil, then lies are the only things that actually prevent us from choosing the good and refusing the evil. And of course, as we've spoken of many times, lies are really nothing. So, the only way to actually choose the good and refuse the evil is to absolutely refuse to accept the thought that it's difficult. 
It's to refuse the thought, you know, that refuse any thought that would prevent you. You know, any time an obstacle presents itself to you as, you know, an obstacle between you and the right decision, refuse to accept it as an obstacle. It's merely a mirage. That's all it is. Any other thoughts on that or on uh, the other aspects here of the paragraph? Or I guess of this first part of the paragraph? Um, I just have a little something to add and comment to John's question. And that is, you know, as we learn more and more about our heavenly family and about the truth, we will be able to recognize why we really don't want to be disobedient. You know, the fact that it seems like we want to do things that are wrong, I think, for a lot of people at least, that um, the devil has convinced us that we want that life when I think that if we took the time to investigate what the truth really is, it would expose the lie of uh, saying that we're going to have any kind of happiness in disobedience and then we'll recognize, no, that's not what we really want at all. And um, I don't know, it's just as I was thinking about it more, I thought, you know, just knowing the truth more and more should just really help us to recognize uh, that any thought of happiness or joy or satisfaction from disobedience is a delusion or a deception. And then we'll be able to recognize like, oh, well, why would I want to do that? I don't want to do that. And then we just don't do that. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking the idea of, okay, yeah, the truth and how the truth can actually do all these different things and actually can, you know, it's just lies that prevent us and what is it, you know, that makes it so difficult? Well, really nothing, you know. When, now, when I say things like that, just to be clear, I understand how it can come across like, no, but it's not that easy. You know, it can't, it can't be that easy. Obviously, it's not that easy because my experience isn't it being that easy, you know, things like that. Now, I understand that it can come across like that, and it can come across like, no, there's something else beyond just refusing to accept the thought that it's so difficult and this and that. But here's the thing. I have to declare that that is the truth. It is the truth. And, you know, if what we've experienced is it being really difficult, but our response to the thought that it's not that difficult is, oh, but it it has to be more difficult. Well, look what we're doing to ourselves, right? Like, if as I was giving the explanation I just did, if any one of you were thinking, no, but it can't be like that. It's got to be, you know. Well, that's the problem right there, right? I mean, imagine what it would be like if you didn't have the attitude of it can't be that easy. It has to be more difficult than that. If you, you know, basically what's happening is that in saying, no, it has to be more difficult, you're making it more difficult for yourself, and you're refusing to attempt the way of just accepting the truth. And so that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, it's showing you that the trial isn't actually, you know, the thing that makes it difficult 
isn't actually choosing to accept truth and refuse lies. It's choosing to accept lies and refuse truth. That's the thing that makes it more difficult. Whereas if you simply, upon hearing the things that were just expressed, if you simply said, you know what? Okay. Yeah. If I refuse the lies and accept the truth, well then, yeah, it it won't be so difficult to choose and this and that. If you take that attitude, how do I think Ellen White, I think even somewhere in the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart. Exactly, so that's easy. what I've been waiting to <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, as a man thinketh in his heart so easy. If you think it's going to be so difficult, well, yeah, you know, it is. You're basically setting yourself up for a trial. But if you, I mean, and here's the thing. I just want to put it out there for you guys. We're told to have an experimental religion. Experiment. If you haven't tried just accepting the truth and refusing the lies, and you haven't tried just taking the attitude that anything that presents itself as an obstacle, that you will refuse it as being an obstacle, but you will view it as just an illusion of an obstacle, If you haven't tried that yet, well, what do you have to lose? You know, try it. Make the experiment. Taste and see. Amen. Amen. The battle is a battle for the mind. The way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to say, too, that for every lie, there's you don't just have to get rid of the lie, but there's a truth that can displace it. And I was listening to um, the two ways and counting the cost, which um, were presented back in October of 2015. And um, so one of the lies is that it's too much to give up all. You know, it's, it's just too much to do to give up all and so um, Trent was talking about you know Christ and what he gave up and so if we think about that and you know just just his last few hours of life on earth we just think about how he was treated and everything he went through and then think is it too much to give up all and um, you know I mean the truth of it is it's not too much to give up all, right? And so, um, I don't know, I just encourage everybody to go back and listen to that because, you know, it it is a discipline of the mind, but it's also a a love issue too. I mean, it's just like, it's it's just so compelling when you think about, about our heavenly family and everything they gave up. Amen. And I just want to briefly add to that how literally if we refuse the truth, that in a more ultimate and literal sense is giving up all. The truth is all there is. If we give up the truth for the sake of a lie, we give up all. It's choosing non-existence rather than existence. It's choosing immaterialism rather than materialism. Um, It reminds me of James White's poem at the end of his article on the personality of God. Um, At the end of, or in his poem, he basically talks about how, I forget exactly how he put it, we claim the earth, the air, and the air, the earth, the sun, the sun, the sky. Yeah, and all, all the, the starry, starry worlds, worlds on high. high. You know, gold, ore, and precious stones, and bodies made, made of, of flesh, flesh and bones. You know, he talked about how, basically, both the immaterialist and the atheist claim nothing, and nothing is what they will receive. But we claim all. You know, so we give up our all, which is nothing 
and that is gaining all. So this, I just wanted to mention this because this is the reality of the circumstance that demonstrates the truth of the comment that Carol just made, how it is not too much to give up all. That is all of ourselves. Because by giving up all, we gain all. He who loses his life will save it. I was interested also in, uh, Christina, if you could repeat your comment. Um, I guess whenever, in case there's anyone else who wanted to comment more on this topic, maybe we'll check on that first. But um, I wanted to hear what you had to say again as well, if you're able to repeat it. I would be happy to. Um, I was just pointing out um, the aspect of our adversary's characteristic um, of his desire to um, basically, you know, be selfish and how he's being or how our adversary is stubborn. And um, I guess I don't need to say this, but I do because I recognize that in myself and in family traits. And that's something that's commonly accepted in our culture and often overlooked and how that is a critical piece of our adversary's behavior and the extreme consequences of it. Right. The stubbornness was the key point you were bringing out, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that Ellen White's comments... Uh, that we read last night highlight that so much, how Lucifer was pled with so much and for so long, and our Heavenly Family actually basically showed him how his dissatisfaction was without cause. And she said that he had not at that point utterly forsaken his... um, how does she put it, not loyalty, but allegiance, allegiance to the government of God. And if he had just been willing to humble himself, then he could have actually been reinstated in his former position. But it was his stubbornness and his pride that that basically... Um, were his factors that he that he chose to go with, you know? He just allowed himself to be stubborn. And because of that, he refused to change from his path. Wow. It does show how, how key that issue is. I was thinking a lot about when you described that situation in which um, our Heavenly Family was pleading with him and all they asked him to do was just to repent and surrender. And, you know, that's just exactly what we're being asked to do. And our Heavenly Family, you know, they pled a long time with him. And, you know, when you described that, I thought, wow, you know, how different are we? You know, our Heavenly Family's been pleading a long time with us. And right. they have presented this this to us in so many different ways over the last three years. And that's all they're asking us to do. And we think, you know, when we think about the situation with Satan, well, how in the world could he just, you know, all he had to do was just, all he had to do was just surrender and just repent. That's it. Why didn't he do that? You know, but there may be those of us that just won't do that. And how sad. Mm-hmm. How very sad. Yeah, we have to give up our stubbornness, give up our love of self, our pride. Just be willing to let it go. all go. Um, Ellen White does say that 
and this is just a paraphrase, but I read a statement that conveys this thought earlier today, and the last line of it is more of a direct quote. But she talks about how, you know, we must surrender, but none of us of ourselves are able to just surrender to God. She said that we must be willing to be made willing. So salvation is a cooperation of the divine and the human. So when we are wicked, when we are dead in trespasses and sins, the dry bones of Ezekiel's valley, we actually... um, are stubborn and hard-hearted and are unwilling to give up self. Because obviously, if we were willing to give up self, we would have done it. So we have to recognize our own unwillingness and then be willing to be made willing to recognize that our Heavenly Family can actually change our spirit, change our, our attitude, to a willing attitude to be changed, and then we will, we will be changed. Amen. Any other comments or questions on either the aspects we've been discussing or uh, anything else from this first sentence? I just wanted to say amen and thank you, Heavenly Family. Sorry I derailed the subject a little bit, um, but uh, I appreciate it. Well, you know, I don't think it was a derail at all. I think Mm -hmm. that that was exactly right on the point of, you know, what needed to be brought out and discussed. Oh, it was good, and it was a blessing for me, too. I'm glad you mentioned it. Amen. It was helpful for me. It was helpful for me, too, so thanks for asking that. Amen. It was just something that uh, was sneakily pressing, so I don't know how the words formulated, but they did. (laughs) Amen. Okay. Um, Other comments, questions on this first part? Uh, that last part, for his soul detests the wise teaching of just laws. You know, I, all kinds of thoughts really are going through my mind in relation to that, from Satan being upset about, you know, uh, the order in heaven which required him to not be included in the creation of mankind, etc. And... Uh, also, coming to humanity, how upset people get when you say that there's a law that is required for us to keep. Like, nobody wants law. And so, you, know, you could almost say they detest the law. But it's odd in a way, it's, it's kind of a circular type reasoning or situation because they don't think that it's good, well, the majority at least, don't think that it's good to murder or steal or whatever, but the idea of a law is um, really offensive to a lot of people. And including... The ceremonial law, you know, let's not exclude those who say the Ten Commandments are binding, but it's this other part of the law that isn't, and, you know, being very upset about um, any type of observance of the ceremonial law. I think that part of it is a misunderstanding of the idea of law 
and I think that's probably res you know a result of people misapplying the idea of laws, including lawmakers, because law and policy are almost synonymous in many circumstances. And so in a situation like that, if people think that that's what law is, mm -hmm. it's just the dictates of the ruling class. Right. Well, then, yeah, you know, anyone who isn't the ruling class probably wouldn't like that. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that that type of idea has blackened the idea of law, and so people end up thinking that it's something that is um, oppressing them and something that is restricting them, when that's not actually the scriptural idea of law. And, of, of course, I think that probably many of you here are aware of the fact that law isn't the only way to translate the word Torah, which is the word commonly translated law, and such as is here as well, um, but that perhaps it is even better translated as instruction. Um, that makes a big difference. Like, do, do we want instruction just as people in general? Yeah, people want instruction. People want to know how to go about doing things. And so... You know, that's, that's basically it. Um, but it's not only instruction in the sense of how to, but it's instruction as in instructing people about the way, you know, about the way things are. Like explaining to people, showing people, teaching people the way things are. So, for instance, like um, in John chapter 10, Jesus is speaking to certain Jews and and they're saying, oh, you know, how can you say you're the son of God, so on and so forth, it's blasphemy. And he said, does it not say in your law, I have said you are gods? Well, there he's actually quoting from Psalm uh, 82. I've said you are gods. That's Psalm 82. That's not... Um, any sort of legislative, civil type of, <clears throat> you know, what we would typically think of as laws, but he said it's law, Torah. That's, that's law, that's instruction, that's teaching, and that's actually, you know, he, he uses that word to refer to the Psalms. So I think within that understanding, more people could relate to it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So the interesting, by the way, how it says, <clears throat> his soul detests the wise teaching of just laws. So the laws have things to teach us. You know, the wise teaching of just instructions. That's another way to translate that. Um something that I find interesting about this first sentence as well is, again, the whole context is someone who is not willing to enter the covenant, which, of course, is in the context of the covenant ceremony. So if someone is not willing to actually go through that covenant ceremony, according to this, it is because their soul detests the wise teaching of just laws. So what is the expression of the wise teaching of just laws in this context? The covenant ceremony. Yeah. Or the covenant. Yeah, the, it's yeah, really the things that are said in the covenant ceremony. That's the expression of the wise teaching of just laws. And so... Yeah, and perhaps it could be even more broad to refer to the teachings of the community. 
so that being the case, it's I just find that interesting because it's it's portraying kind of the the overall idea of that covenant ceremony um, as being the wise teachings of just laws. So it, it makes sense, of course, from the perspective of the community that anyone who refuses to have that covenant ceremony and to enter into the covenant by taking these oaths is really, uh, I mean, what reason could one have for not doing that, you know, for refusing such a thing? Of course, this is referring to those who refuse. It's not just anyone who doesn't, because there's many people who aren't aware. And so it's not uh, speaking any rebuke against them, but it's speaking rebuke against one who refuses to enter the community by going through the covenant ceremony. So are there any other comments or questions in relation to this first sentence? I just have a couple. One thing is, you know, uh, being a mother, having raised a child and having given them instruction, you know, that's a completely different way to look at it um, from thinking, you know, like if my child thought, oh, you know, my mom just gave me all these laws, you know, that everything I was teaching her every day was just laws. Because, you know, it's, it just has a little bit... Um, of a negative ring to it, you know, compared to the idea of instruction. And then the other thing is, you know, our enemy would like for us to believe that we are we're gaining freedom by um, not following God's law, you know, because his law is do what thou wilt. And so, you know, people that follow follow him in rebellion and, you know, they think they're getting out of... of um, you know, following someone. But they're really not because they're Satan's slave and so they're, in a sense, you know, being, uh, I guess you could say forced, not really forced, but they're they're being um, tricked. Used. What? I just said used. Used, yes, and, and tricked and seduced into, into um, breaking the law. For sure, yeah. Did you have another comment as well? No, that was it. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um... So, yeah, I think that that, that sentence, uh, and actually I'll just ask you guys, is it just and righteous to, to have it be the case that anyone who refuses to enter the covenant should not be um, permitted to enter the community? Well, of course. I mean, that would be like uh, you want to join this club in town, uh, but you don't want to abide by their rules. I mean, that's kind of a silly thing to do. I mean, who's going to invite you in, you know, <laughs> to be part of them if they know that you're going to come in and disrupt everything? Sure. Makes sense. Yeah, I, it is in that sense. It's just really kind of a common sense type thing. Um and it's just the same sort of principle as why Lucifer could not be allowed to remain in heaven. You know, I mean, yeah, it's it's totally destructive to everyone. I was just thinking, like, it's like parents going into the community, and the parents are so exciting and all this, 
But then the children under 18 years old kind of like need to go with the parents to the community, but then the children don't really want to go in there because they, they've been separated from the world. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that reminds me of Family Greetings Volume 1, number 1, perhaps, or number 2, um, where Victor Hoda, he he talks about this whole thing, and he speaks to parents at, I mean, you know, Victor Hoda, the timely greetings are, the timely greetings are, um, basically a written form of sermons that Hadith preached at Mount Carmel Center to Davidians. And in this one uh, sermon, which again, I think it's volume one, number one, or volume one, number two, Victor Hadith said, hey, you know, you guys have, have come here by your own choice and you desire to come here but your children have come in your luggage, as it were, is, is how he put it. And um, and he was pointing out to them how, you know, everyone goes through their prodigal experience, and it's, uh, he was kind of encouraging people to learn from others and to not go through a long prodigal experience if they have to go through any, and, um, okay, yeah, Teresa just pulled it up here. It is volume one, number two, page 28. And it says, um, he says, you men and women came on this hill, not because someone brought you, but because you thought it your duty. You nevertheless brought with you these little ones. So it is that you came through the door but the boys and girls came in your luggage, as it were. <laughs> and now, if they are to become permanent members in this sheepfold, they too must pass examination. You see, they are going through their struggle now, just as you adults went through yours before you came here. And as somebody put forth effort for you there in like manner, you now must put forth effort for your youth here. And he goes on, um, but that's the section I was referring to. And um, the fact of the matter is that children, no matter who their parents are, are born into the family that they are and have to live within the government of their family regardless. You know, that's just the way it is. There are people out there, um, you know, I had friends when I was in high school who grew up in a household where basically they had to smoke pot their whole life because... That's what their parents did. That's how they were raised. And they had to have that upbringing, and they didn't really enjoy it. And that's the, the unfortunate situation um, for many children that, hey, you know what? It's, that's just part of the nature of being kids, you know? You have your parents, and you have to live with whatever they have chosen to make you live with, so to speak. Uh, so I just say that to, to say that that's, that is just how it is, and people should recognize, children should be brought to recognize how, you know what, there are far worse situations out there. And beyond that, what the obligation of the parents is and those who are around the, the uh, children as well within present truth is to guide them to see the blessing of the truth. Amen. You know, because the fact of the matter is, even though, yes, that's how it is, you know, that they have to be raised 
in whatever community their parents are in, no matter what it is, um, they shouldn't be uh, brought to look at it as a burden or a misfortune. They should be brought to see how, hey, look, all children have to be raised, you know, by their parents and so on. And look at all these alternatives, you know. It could be a really bad situation, but look at the blessing and privilege of being raised in this community with truth and so on. And sure, children are free moral agents just like anyone else, and they can choose to just be stubborn and, you know, rebel if they if they want. I I don't know of any prescribed um, solution to that within the community rule. I know that in um, the Pentateuch, if a if someone's child is rebellious persistently then basically they have to be cut off from the community. And I think that the Pentateuchal or the the Pentateuch's um, method for that is stoning. I mean, I assume they could run away, (laughs) but if they were going to want to stay in the community and just continue to rebel, the, the judgment in the Pentateuch, was stoning. The community rule, I don't think, uh, has, you know, it doesn't have any death penalties or anything like that in the community rule. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that the community rule is written in a context in which the Jews were under a foreign yoke, you know, so they couldn't actually execute death penalty and this and that, um, and it be within an independent system in which that could be lawful. It was in a system in which basically they couldn't do that or it would be unlawful for them to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's basically you do what you can with your children to raise them up in the truth and teach them to appreciate it and cut off all corrupting influences and so on. And a lot can be done, you know, to give them the greatest opportunity possible. And if it comes to the place where they just rebel and rebel and rebel and refuse to accept the principles of truth and the principles of that... um, by which the community operates, then eventually they will have to go. Just as as Lucifer had to go. But, you know, they can be pled with for a long time. And then by the time that they are old enough, or basically by the time that it's that they have to go, through the necessary pleading that would take place, they would likely be old enough to live on their own and take care of themselves and all that anyway just because of pleading with them and being patient with them and giving them opportunity after opportunity. So I hope that that helps. Do you have any idea like how many people in the community? Uh, I don't know how many people were in the community, really. Um, Other than... I think Josephus uh, gave a number, a rough number in it, but I'm not sure at which time he was referring to this. It might have been the latter part of the first century A.D., um, before the destruction of the temple. And uh, I'm trying to remember, I think he said somewhere around 4,000 or something like that, uh, but that, I might be confusing that with the Pharisees, but I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think he said something like 4,000, but that was, again, far later on in the history of the Essenes than the community rule. Um, going back to the 
to the middle of the second century or, you know, end of the second century. B.C., closer to the beginning of the, the community, I really don't know how many there were. It's hard to know if there were more or less as well. Um, there used to be more Davidians, uh, or at least more recognized Davidians than there are now. Uh, I think that the numbers of Davidians have gone down most likely, at least in ratio. Um, there used to be a lot of Davidians in comparison to what there are now as compared to Adventism as a whole. Um, so, yeah, who knows exactly how many there are now, though, because there's so many organizations and uh, so many just uh, freelance Davidians or whatever, independent Davidians. So sometimes it's hard to know, and in the ancient world, I'm sure it was equally hard, if not harder, to know. All right, are there any other comments or questions on this first sentence? Okay. Um, so we have been on for just over an hour. And so we could either continue on into the next sentence, or we could stop here and pick up with the next sentence tomorrow night. What do you guys all think? I would like to go on because it's been so good so far. I, I'm just really enjoying it. I'd like to learn more, but that's my opinion. Okay. Well, it's valued. So anyone want to second that or say something different or anything? All right. <laughs> well, I didn't One. want to persuade anybody, but I'm definitely enjoying it as well. And I, I of course, would understand it's a weeknight and people having to go to work, but um, I know everyone in Michigan are not owls. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, how about at least one more sentence? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. I think that that's good. And, you know, we'll... Uh, Heavenly Family, if we shouldn't have this go on for too much longer, um, please, I guess really what we're asking is please guide this to be exactly the length that it should be and help us to cover the ground and the principles that you want us to cover. Amen. It is a feast after all. It is a feast. Amen. Okay, excellent. I'm happy to continue on to the next sentence. All right. So, I'll read it here. So again, it's referring to the person who refuses to enter the covenant. It says, He shall not be counted among the upright, for he has not persisted in the conversion of his life. Any comments or questions? I think that sentence pretty much sums up like all what Adventism is, is that they haven't continued on with the conversion of their life, and therefore it's why they've rejected the righteousness by faith message, because <laughs> they just don't want to change. Or, and I don't either. <laughs> like, it's really hard. I mean, I shouldn't say that, because we just learned that I shouldn't say that, but um, challenging to have to be deprogram my way of thinking. We've been so conditioned for such a long time. Yeah, we certainly have. But I'm just so grateful how by beholding we become changed. Amen. And it's just like, seriously, if we just continually focus on truth and make it a point to not allow 
something else to come in and dominate our thinking, well then, how else could, could it happen but that we would become absorbed by the truth and start thinking, you know, talking about reprogramming our thinking and all of that. It's like, yeah, I mean, if we absolutely just make the truth our focus and dwell on it and just dwell on it and dwell on it, yeah, that's going to change how we think a lot, you know. So in that sense, it's, it's simple. It's uh, like the flower. It just has to abide in the sunshine. I wish I could repeat that to those who have fallen out of the message. It's like I, have, I think pretty much all of us here in Michigan have had in some areas a horrible year and then in others like a huge blessing. And I think that's just what we're doing is that we're beholding this message like failing in some areas in our lives and then realizing areas that like certainly need work not knowing how it's going to change, but believing that it can. And that's all that we can do is, is just, like, behold our evening meetings and, and our time together. And I just thank you for that. It just really, really stood out to me. I've had battled with so much depression this, this whole year, but gone through some, you know, everybody's going through things. But is the one thing is I told Mary that, like, that I read my way out of depression. And I just thank you Amen. for all the materials that you've written for us. Because, you know, even like sending a message causes depression because you just you realize what your state is. And I know that's now part of the dry bones. But, but that the whole point is, is to behold it and to not give up even though like we're stumbling so, so hard. Yeah. Man, thank you, Heavenly Family. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing, I mean, the the message does bring a test and a trial. You know, doubtless, it's a test and a trial for everyone that comes to it. And it's just like, I, I love how you put that, reading your way out of depression. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, every time we faced test, trial, temptation, whatever it may be, just focusing on the truth. And, like, I remember a while back where I would just read and listen to Steps to Christ frequently because, ah, oh, I mean, if someone is just willing, like, kind of no matter how they feel and all that, if someone just is like, okay, I'm going to read Steps to Christ right now, I mean, that's going to change a lot. (laughs) You know, it's going to really um, give them hope and courage. And yeah, yeah, these, truth does make a difference. Amen. There was a thought that came to my mind in relation to this sentence in the community rule. And I wasn't quite sure how it was phrased or where it would be found and that sort of thing. And I'm not uh, even certain if this is exactly what I might have been thinking of. It was such a vague, formulated thought. But I want to share it anyway. Um, I found it in Victor Hodes, but he was quoting Ellen White. So I'm going to Ellen White. It's in Christ's Object Lessons. And focusing on the persisting in the conversion of his life. He has not persisted in the conversion of his life. So Christ's Object Lessons, um, page 343, paragraph 4. I'm going to read the whole paragraph. Upon the right improvement of our time depends our success in acquiring knowledge and mental culture. The cultivation of the intellect need not be prevented by poverty, 
humble origin, or unfavorable surroundings. Only let the moments be treasured. A few moments here and a few there that might be frittered away in aimless talk, the morning hours so often wasted in bed, the time spent in traveling on trams or railway cars, or waiting at the station, the moments of waiting for meals, waiting for those who are tardy in keeping an appointment, if a book were kept at hand, and these fragments of time were improved in study, reading, or careful thought, what might not be accomplished? A resolute purpose, persistent industry, and careful economy of time will enable men to acquire knowledge and mental discipline which will qualify them for almost any position of influence and usefulness. And so I thought, oh, that seems uh, fitting when we consider he shall not be counted among the upright for he has not persisted in the conversion of his life. And here, in Ellen White's writing, there's an example of persistent industry. Amen. Other comments? Yes, this is um, why B.T. Hoddeth had a lot of his stuff in little teeny tracks so that we could stick them in our purse or pocket or something so that whenever we're somewhere and we're just standing there wasting time, we can pull something out and read it. So I take advantage of that, and I carry them around with me. And when I'm just sitting, I will try to read something and just meditate on something, you know. So I really appreciate that those are in little track forms. Amen. Amen. I do that with Steps to Christ, and I have a little New Testament and Psalms Bible. And yes, so many times uh, there have been appointments where I've had to sit and wait. And yep, just grab it, pull it out, and all the tracks and TGs, absolutely so perfect for that sort of thing. And it's amazing today, too, how... You know, here we are, and we have phones yeah. <laughs> with, um, you know, the entire Ellen White library. There's even a Shepherd's Rod app, on, at least for iPhone. I think it's for Android, too, where you can have Victor Hoddus literature. Um, you know, and the Bible, and Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, you know, all that stuff. We can have all that stuff just at our fingertips, in our pockets, literally all the time, anywhere. That's just so amazing. I mean, what a miracle that is. Wow. The other thing about this sentence that stood out to me is that it, it's teaching or it's proclaiming the same thing that are one of the same aspects of the present message, and that is that we must do something. And it's not the only message. You know, other past messages have put this forth too. But um, it takes an effort. It takes a choice, an active decision to obtain righteousness. You're not going to sit back and wait for God to do something for you and see any change. You have to act. And so um, if you don't act, if you don't persist in the conversion of your life, you may not be counted among the upright. Well, if you don't persist, you will not. I think it is fair to say that. Mm -hmm. Um, If you don't persist, in the conversion of your life, you will not be counted among the upright. So, again, I would have to say that this is teaching a true principle. Amen.
Yeah, there's a lot that Elamite says about uh, not only does he use the word persistence, but perseverance. And there's some excellent statements that she has on that. Are there any other comments or questions on this uh, sentence before we move on to the next? Okay. The next sentence. His knowledge, powers, and possessions shall not enter the council of the community. For whoever plows the mud of wickedness returns defiled. Any comments or questions on that sentence? Starting to get into ritual purity sounds like again. Important. I have a question. So does it mean we don't accept outsiders' donations? You were cutting out. Can you repeat that? Oh, so does that mean we don't accept other people's donations? Oh. Okay. I see. Um, <clears throat> there is actually, I mean, that's a, a very good question. However, I just want to point out one kind of aspect of what this is referring to, because this isn't just referring to anyone who's not part of the community. This is referring to someone who refused to enter the covenant to enter the community. So, in other words, this isn't just anyone. It's someone who um, might have entered the, the covenant but chose not to. And so that person is to be kept off. So that's, that's basically all that this paragraph is saying. It doesn't address the question one way or the other as to whether someone could be, um, whether the community could be benefited by someone else's knowledge, powers, and possessions. Um, Ellen White does refer to that question, though. She speaks of it. Um, I wish I remembered exactly the pamphlet now. I can go and get the book if I need to. But there's a recent Ellen White pamphlet that I read. Uh, let's see if we can find it here. Okay, let's see. I think it might be pamphlet number eight. Yeah. Um, either pamphlet number eight or pamphlet number nine. Um, pamphlet number eight is, oh no, pamphlet nine is there too. Okay, pamphlet eight or pamphlet nine. Um, yeah, could you click that one? Okay. Okay, so basically uh, it's either pamphlet eight or pamphlet nine in uh, the Ellen White pamphlets. It's on the pamphlet section of the Ellen White CD-ROM and the EGW Writings website. Um, in one of these pamphlets, Ellen White addresses this question of whether or not the church can receive support from those not in the message. And um, she talks about how all of the means, whether financial or otherwise, in the whole world ultimately belong to God. And that God has blessed people both in the message and outside the message, with certain privileges, certain financial blessings, and so on and so forth. And she said that he moves upon people, some within the message, some without, to use their means for his cause. And she actually advocated in whatever situations, you know, when there's a need for 
people within present truth to wisely present the the work before people, and she even said before wealthy people, um, who are not of the faith, to present it to them um, and to show them the work that is being done and, you know, whether it's, hey, we're, you look at what is being done in terms of educating people or health and this and that, and she says that it should be presented to them and it should be, the opportunity should be given to them to give gifts to support that work. So Ellen White certainly advocated uh, that idea. And um, there may be times when that is going to have to be the case, where we'll have to ask for donations from people not of our faith. Um, and there's people out there who will be able to see, hey, you know what, that's a worthy cause. I want to donate for it. So that reading that pamphlet uh, recently for me was actually very helpful in understanding how the principle applies. Um, she gave the example of Nehemiah and how when he was going to go build the wall, he went and um, basically petitioned for, uh, I think it was, yeah, the Medo-Persian rulers to give. And, you know, then there's also the example of how the tabernacle was built with the, the riches of the Egyptians. Um, interestingly, though, Nehemiah, even though he got wealth and support from the government of his day in order to do the work of building the wall, yet when others who were locals in the area went to go and, you know, supposedly help building the wall and all that, he refused. He refused to have them involved in doing that work. So, also kind of interesting, Victor Hodef had to borrow money from a number of different people in order to buy uh, Mount Carmel Center. And I'm not sure one way or the other um, if those people, if all of them, that is, were in present truth. Um, but I do know that he followed Nehemiah's example in not having people who weren't part of present truth actually participate in building up New Mount Carmel Center. Perhaps he would have accepted donations, you know, support from people, but not actually engaging in the work. Um, so yeah, does that help? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Wonderful. Yeah, so I will mention, too, that I, I'm interested to see as we continue on reading the community rule if it says anything else on that principle of whether or not it is all right to receive things from people not of the faith and different things like that. And just the relationship between believers and unbelievers in general this is something that we should focus on because certainly the community rule calls for separation between believers and unbelievers. Um, so it's important for us to understand what the community rule teaches concerning the nature of that separation and the extent of that separation. Hey, Trent. Any? Yep. Um, something that I learned at Weimar that um, I don't know if this is applicable or not, but when I was studying the health message over there, um, there was a man named David Fiedler that came in, and I don't know if anybody's read his book, but it's called The Sozo, and he got a hold of a lot of um, Ellen White documents, 
they were friends through a friend that he just happened to like just find that in somebody's basement. And basically what we had learned was one of the big sins of Kellogg was that he had went off at, to do more humanitarian work instead of stay in his localized area and gain funds that way and that the church reached out and went to spread the gospel and the message to the poor and to the lower class. And I, I can't quote this correctly because I just don't know where it's at, and I haven't really looked for it since then. But um, he was. what we learned was that we were, Ellen White had kind of rebuked the, the earlier members because, do, rebuked them because they went to the poor instead of going to those who are wealthy. And she had said that if we had gone to the wealthy and those of the upper class that, that their money would diffuse down and that they would be inspired by the message and be able to help the message grow and go a lot further. And it's kind of interesting because we see that even in all other denominations that we, we go out to the poorest of the poor to do mission work when it's just as equally important to go out and reach the, the wealthy and the rich. So um, I, don't, I think that as people come to know and learn the truth that aren't Adventist or, or Branch Davidian, that, that they would be inspired to give and to donate when they see that people are living up to the truth and that they have the light may have present truth with them. So that's that's my opinion. <laughs> well, I would say it's more than just your opinion, too. Um, so I'll say amen to that. I actually just read uh, Ellen from Ellen White in another pamphlet on that recently. Uh, I think it's, uh, let me just see, it's pamphlet... Okay, I thought it was something about Australia. Okay, I'm not quite seeing it yet. It might be, um, might even be pamphlet number one or pamphlet number two. Okay, um, but yeah, Ellen White certainly said the things that you're referring to where yeah, she she certainly gave even heavy rebuke to to the the church for focusing too much on witnessing to the poor to the exclusion of witnessing to others in the upper class and so on. And yeah, she was definitely um advocating a change in their plans and their arrangements and to really try and witness to people who were wealthier because they need salvation just as much as the poor classes do and that if they would receive the message then like you're saying they would be inspired to use their means for the benefit of present truth and everything would actually just go faster and it would be better for the work overall and for the poor and for you know the others people of more influence and the fact is yeah if you reach people with influence well then they can reach others um, so this is actually you know one of this is something we all need to be praying about and different ones of us have different different spheres of influence and different contacts and all of that. Um, but we, we can expand our contacts and we can ask our Heavenly Family to show us where to focus in who to witness to and all that. I'll tell you, one of the things that has been on my heart, a burden that I've had, is for various scholars. I mean, some of them aren't you know, I don't think that most scholars are rich or anything like that, um, but they're influential in the religious world. And 
some of these guys, I mean, these guys spend their whole lives studying the Bible. And, you know, I'm aware of however many of them, mostly the guys who are involved in, like, publishing Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, translating those texts, um, Dead Sea Scroll stuff, or whatever, because, you know, those are resources that we need available to us, so I've, you know, become familiar with those things. And so, yeah, you know, some of these scholars are so, so knowledgeable about just the, the various texts, the various languages, and all these other things, and it's like, yeah, I, I just have a burden for some of them because it seems like such a pity and such a shame to know so much about these very things and not get to live it, you know? And I know that if some of these people were reached with present truth, which they can be, it's not actually a far-fetched idea. I mean, a number of these scholars are like, you know, whatever, Lutheran, Pentecostal, you know, whatever, just different denominations. And it's like, if they go to churches and hear preachers preach the things that preachers normally preach, and they've been persuaded by that on a religious level, it's like, well, surely they could be persuaded by present truth, you know? So um, if some of these people were you know, became believers in present truth and took the principles of the message and applied it in their work, well, then these people would have a large influence on the religious world because, you know what, the fact of the matter is these scholars are the ones who translate texts that are used in universities. They're the ones who translate Bibles that are used in churches and that are used in homes. And... They're the ones, you know, the, pre the professors who teach in seminaries that pastors go to, that all these other people go to. And it's like, you know, that's in terms of the religious world, in many ways, these scholars, you know, they're the educators of the educators in the religious world. And so if they taught right things and better things than they currently teach... I mean, they could just have such a great influence, and it would have its ripple effect down to the people in the pews, not only in Adventism, but in all churches, and even beyond that, in synagogues and so on. So that's that's a a burden that I've had, and you know, praying about how and when to go about that. Yeah, I think people, the one reason why people don't witness to the wealthy more or to the higher educated is because they feel intimidated. And so we shouldn't feel intimidated, especially when we have the truth on our side. And we should um, feel the burden for the educated and the wealthy just as much as we should for the poor or the uneducated. And you know, they need salvation as much as anyone. Amen. We need to view them as the individuals they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, are there any other comments or questions concerning what we have just spoken about and or read? Well, I will say that on this sentence, his knowledge, powers, and possessions shall not enter the, the council of the community, for whoever plows the mud of wickedness returns defiled. Again, uh, it certainly sounds like ritual purity, impurity language. Absolutely. And I would not be surprised if there isn't a whole lot more that we could 
uh, glean from this or, you know, look into and that sort of thing, I, I certainly wouldn't want to um, miss anything regarding it. So I would imagine we'll continue with this some more tomorrow night. Sounds good. I was wanting to mention in regard to Adventist leaders how I am very hopeful in regard to Adventist leaders or however many Adventist leaders. Um, but over the past couple of years, I have seen a number of Adventist leaders who say things that give me hope. And there is definitely some, you know, there's changes within Adventism, um, some of which may be more positive. Like, I've heard some Adventist leaders, like people who are at the theological top of Adventism, say things like, the spirit of prophecy is not really the writings of Ellen White. It is actually the the spirit working through prophets in any generation. Now, of course, it wasn't stated as clearly as, as we understand it in regard to the spirit speaking through a living prophet, but they at least have a, a broader understanding of it than Adventists have had for, you know, the past hundred years. And there's one uh, Adventist leader who I've heard who actually went as far to say that he believes that um, some of the Adventists at large do not believe in spiritual gifts. They believed in spiritual gift manifested through one person and that that person's gone. And the same individual, the same leader, said that he believes that at some point there's going to be another prophet in Adventism and that when, um, when a, another prophet is manifested, the church will be split right down the middle or something like that. The church will be split over it. And... Uh, so I just thought that that was fascinating, you know, totally. to hear that from an Adventist leader. Um, and there's many other statements that I've heard. Uh, one Adventist leader is vocal in speaking out against the misuse of the fundamental beliefs and how they're being used as a creed and testing membership and all that. And this Adventist leader is very much you know, saying, hey, this is not right. This is not how we should use it. It's entirely contrary to the principle of the fundamental beliefs from the beginning in Adventism, and it's contrary to just principles of truth and justice, period. And so, you know, things like that, you know, true religious liberty within Adventism. There are some Adventist leaders standing up for principles like that and others on other various doctrinal issues that Adventists used to be strongly opposed to, certain Adventist leaders are now advocating certain positions. Um, so, you know, things like that really encourage me because some of these individuals who are in leadership in Adventism at the present time are not entirely unreasonable. You know, some of them can be reasoned with if they are approached rightly. And um, there used to be good relations between the branch movement and Adventist leadership in the days of Ben and Lois. And that was entirely lost, of course, in 1993, but it's been a while now, and good relations might be able to begin again. And, you know, 
uh, the vice president of the Davidian Association under Victor Hodef was a man named E.T. Wilson, who was actually a president of a Adventist conference. So, you know, that's uh, it just shows that leaders in the not-too-distant past have actually accepted the truth and followed it as well. So, there's much reason to be encouraged and to expect much and attempt much. Amen. I've seen things in the quarterly study by the writers that are kind of promising, kind of questioning if we're doing things just right. And I remember there was a retired general conference president, or maybe he wasn't retired at the time, but he was saying, we need more women in the in the uh, work. Amen. Yeah, a lot of Adventist leaders leading up to the uh, women's ordination vote, there was a number of Adventist scholars and leaders who actually made videos. Um, I think it was all part of one series, and they were all pleading with people to consider things in a different light. And they were all speaking in favor of women's ordination. So, um, we have been on now for another 50 minutes or so since uh, we decided to continue on. So, if there are no other comments, and if there are, again, feel free to mention it, but don't take your time in uh, coming to that point because we'll be closing off unless people mention that they have other comments or questions. Um, But if there aren't any other comments or questions, would somebody like to volunteer to close with prayer? I just have a comment. I just want to praise our Heavenly Family for the meetings that we're having this week because they really um, they really are just opening my heart and mind to other things that I hadn't even seen before myself. So I just want to say thank you that they're doing that for us. Amen. Amen. I'll second that. Mm-hmm. Teresa already seconded that with me. <laughs> yeah. I'll volunteer to pray. Okay. Dear Heavenly Family, we just thank you so much that you are offering us this covenant and laying it out so plainly to us. We just thank you for the truth that sets us free. And I just ask you to send angels to each one of us to um, dispel the darkness and to make it clear how it's, it's easy to accept the truth. And I just ask you to bless each one of us, those of us that have decisions to be made and and opportunities and just please I just ask that you would encourage all of us into action and action into um, as far as choosing action as far as as um, sharing and moving forward with this message and I just thank you and ask all these things in the name of Branch he and she Amen Amen. 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 All right. So, have a wonderful night, everyone. Uh, It sounds like we've all really enjoyed this discussion, and Mm -hmm. I know I certainly have. So, have a good night. Love you all, and look forward to uh, getting together again tomorrow night. Yes, God bless you. Good night. Love you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.